Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss logical access control. Logical access controls are methods, policies, and procedure that manage access. Given access means given permission to someone to use your computer system and network resources. Now, obviously, if you work for the company, they're going to give you access, access to what you need to know, access to the systems that you need in order to, to complete your job. The risk is when outside intruders access your information. So what type of protection, what type of a control can we have? Because logical access control control users' interaction. What can they do with the operating system, application, data? And this ensures that only authorized people, people that are supposed to be accessed, to have access to the system, can access certain resources and perform their job performed the, the allowable action define what action system are actually allowed to perform for example certain people they're only expected to read the document or be able to read this page some people can write some people can execute a program some people can only delete create modify so on and so forth so we don't only give you access when we give you access we give you rights those rights could be any of the one that's on the screen, such as read, write, execute, delete, create, and modify. Now, what are the tools for logical access control? We're going to be covering four tools mainly, authentication, authorizations, firewall, encryptions. Now, are these the only logical access control tools? And the, uh, and the answer is no, we might have others. But in this session specifically, I want to differentiate between authentication and authorization, because Many people confuse the two. Many CPA candidates, many accounting students don't know the difference between the two. So in this session, we're going to go ahead and discuss both authentication and authorization. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. Authentication, what, what does it mean? It's a security process that verify, authenticate who you are, your, your identity, the identity of users, the identity of system or services. It confirm, is it who you are? It's a fundamental component of logical access. And what are we talking about here? How do they make sure that's who you are? Think about password. That's the most simple logical explanation. But we have many type of authentication measure, and this is what we will discuss here. So it's a fundamental component of logical access control, and it's a crucial for ensuring only authorized individual or system can access secured resources or data. Now, how can we give this authentication? Well, sometimes it's something you know. Through that something you know, something special you know, knowledge factor, we can authenticate you. For example, a password is the simplest example of this or answering a question. Something you have, something in your possession, in your hand, and we're going to see what we mean by that. Something you are, inherence factor. We're going to see what these are. Somewhere you are could be a location factor that authenticate you or something you do, behavioral factors. And for each one of those, we are going to discuss a little bit more in depth, starting with something you know, knowledge factor. The most common form of knowledge factor is, you guessed it, password pin. And we are all should be familiar with passwords and pin. If you're watching Farhat Lectures, you needed to access your account. You need to input your email and password. This is as simple as that. To log in on your computer or on your phone, you need to put a pin or a password. Now, it requires the user to provide a secret known only to them. This way they can authenticate themselves to the system. Example, we'll be logging into an email account with a username and password. Now, we have what's called adaptive authentication. So in addition to the password, we can use other attributes like device, location, time of access, and we're going to look at all of those. For example, if you're not logging from a certain device, you are out. If you're not logging from a certain location, you are out. If you're not logging from it during a certain amount of time, you are out. 
And this is to assess the risk level and adapt the authentication process accordingly. To make sure who you are, we add other attributes and we're gonna look at them. For example, we might request additional verification if the user is logging in form of a new device or unusual location. For example, when I log in from another system, from another computer to my work, at, the, at my work, it asks me to authenticate myself. It sends a message to my cell phone and I'll have to input this message. So in addition to the password, the the, the 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 work system knows that I am logging in from an unusual place, not my usual place. That's why it will ask for verification. Sometimes you might have what's called single sign on or SSOs. It allows the user to log in once and gain access to multiple system without being prompted to log in. A case in point here is we're talking about Google. When you log into your Google account, you have access to your Google Drive, Gmail, Google Photos, many Google services without the need to log in separately. Now, this is not really a, uh, it may not be the best secure system, but it's convenient. And if you trust Google, then you should be in good shape. But the password is something that you know. Something that you have is a little bit different. Here, we're talking about security token or smart card, or you would receive a code to your cell phone before you can access the information. So a physical device that generates a time sensitive code or needs to be connected to the system for granting access. Now, Tokens are basically a piece a piece of hardware that generate numbers randomly every 30 seconds. So after you put your login and password, after you put your login and password in banking system for certain accounts, they have it. For example, I am, I'm still, I am, I help my brother with his own accounting. So I do have access to his banking account. So every time I log in, I need that token to generate a pin number for me so even if i lose my password i'll need to lose the password plus the token in order to for the information to be compromised so this is called the multi-factor authentication so you are looking for more than one thing a password is good but everyone thinks password is is weak these days so you need a password plus something else sending you a message to your cell phone or having a security token sometimes you might have a smart card to input in the system so multi-factor authentication or MFA required the user to provide two or more of the above authentication factor in this way increasing the security. Example, login into a bank account online may require a password, something you know, that's fine, and a temporary code sent to your mobile device. And the picture here illustrate the concept. So even if you lose your password, no one can log in unless they have your cell phone. Example, using a hardware token, same thing, that generate a temporary code to log into a secured system. Or you can have something you are, inherence factor, which is it's who you are, your, your biological footprint, basically. Biometrics uses unique biological characteristic for identification. This examples will using fingerprint recognition or facial recognition or voice recognition. So simply put, for example, most phone now they have facial recognition and with the phone now, they, they, can, they can also do facial recognition with or without mask. This is post COVID. It's interesting. Voice, obviously, from your voice, they know who you are. Now, sometimes when you call a customer service department, for example, my brokerage account, they can verify me through my voice. For example, to unlock your phone, you could use the same type of technology or to access a certain area if it's a secure area. Sometimes you are verified through a specific location, location factor. Geolocation uses the geographical location of the user as an additional layer of authentication. For example, you may not be able to access your uh, business information or certain system from a certain region or a country. So once you are there, that's it. They limit you. So you have to be someplace else. Sometimes you can be authenticated through something you do, which is called behavioral factor. Here you're analyzing the unique ways in which the individual interact with the system. What are we talking about here is the keystrokes dynamics, how you type or your mouse movement. Each individual has a certain patterns and the system is smart enough to identify whether you are that user or not. Also, we have authentication for systems and application. Those, if, if the other ones were specific or application, these are general, not application specific, those are general. For example, almost every system and application require users ac ac user access employ some form of verification, authentication. For example, if you log into your operating system, your Windows, it requires you to log in with a username and password and possibly a second factor like a fingerprint. Most web application typically use a combination of username, password with options for MFA, multi-factor authentication. 
to make sure that's who you are. Mobile apps, many mobile apps use biometrics like facial recognition, fingerprint, we talked about this, in addition to or instead of the password. So notice password, it's not going away, but password can be easily, easily, not easily, but it can be guessed. So we need multi-factor authentication. That's kind of what's going to increase the security. Now we're going to move from authentication to authorization. Some people think they're the same. They are not the same. We need to understand the difference between the two. Authorization is the process that comes after, after you've been authenticated. Now we're going to tell you what you can access or not. And it's crucial in determining the permission and level of access a user or a system has to resources within the application system or network. So after you're logged in, what do you have access to that matters? There are different level of authorization, different level of access. Here we involve specifically identifying and managing what, what authenticated users already has been authenticated are allowed to do, what resources they are allowed to access and what operation they are allowed to perform. There are few of them we have role-based access control RBAC. we have discretionary access control DAC. we have mandatory access control mac and we have attribute based access control abac obviously we're going to go through each one making sure we understand it role-based access control basically the users are assigned roles and permission to whatever roles they play users gain permission through the roles whatever the role is a user assigned the role of manager may have read write access to certain file way, while a user with the role of employee may only have read-only access. So based on your role, you have the access. We might have discretionary access control. Owners of the resource have discretion over who has access and what kind of access they have. What are we looking at here? A user can create a file and grant, grant read or write access to other specific users. So they have discretionary. They can give it, take it away. Usually those are admin people. Mandatory access control here, what we're talking about is permission are mandated by a central authority and cannot be changed by user. For example, when the government have top secret information, you cannot access it if you don't have the clearance level. That's it. In a classified military system, a user with a secret clearance level cannot access top secret. It does not matter. It does not allow it. That's it. It's You are prohibited. You could have attribute-based access controls, ABAC. Here you're using attributes like what? Your department, based on your department, or location, or time, assigned to users and resources to determine access. So if you work in that department, you have certain privilege and certain access, or in, or in a certain location, or time. How do we mean, what do we mean by time? For example, an, a user from the HR department may only access employee record during office hours but it's restricted after office hours. So we don't want you to be able to access this information when you're not supposed to. Implementation of authorization. How do we make sure that authorization is being followed? One thing we could have is policy enforcement. Define and enforce what resource users can or cannot access. How do you enforce this really? Create a firewall, allowing or blocking traffic based on certain rules. You could have constraints. Those are additional restriction or condition applied to access. So if you want to, for example, time-based constraint, this is a constraint that restrict access to certain resources outside of the business hours. So you add more constraint in addition to the authentication. In addition to the authorization, you might have other constraints. Auditing, basically what's auditing, reviewing what's going on, involving tracking and login of user activities for review and compliance. A log showing who access a specific file and when. You want to know what's going on. This is how you make sure the authorization is being is being what is being followed properly. Let's take a look at a multiple choice question from Farhat Lectures. That's going to help you understand this topic better. The question reads: Which of the following process is John undergoing every time he logs into the company intranet? Okay, a new employee, John, has just joined XYZ Corporation. As part of the onboarding process, the IT department provided him with credential to access the company intranet. That was the, that's what they provided him. John needs to undergo a process to verify his identity using these credentials every time he logs in. So, what are we talking about here? Is it authorization, encryption, authentication, packet, filtering? Which one is this? Well, let's kind of eliminate the options that we did not cover in this session. We did not cover encryption. But again, in the real world, 
uh, not in the real world, on the exam, on the CPA exam, you cannot say we, we did not cover this. Once you know what encryption is, it's a method to secure information um, by converting it into a, coded into, into a coded form. So if somebody intercepted it, they cannot read it. We're not talking about here. This is about logging in. So encryption is out. How about packet filtering? Again, we did not cover it in this session, but you need to know this is a firewall technique used to control network access by monitoring outgoing and ingoing, basically filtering through the firewall. We're not talking about any firewall here. So the answers are either authorization or authentication. So which one of this? Is it authorization or is, or is it authentication? Well, here's what's going to happen. What am I doing? I am asking John to log in. I am not giving John any authorization. We're not talking about what can John do or cannot do. We're just showing them how they can access the company intranet, the, the system. Now, we, we did not specify what can or cannot John do. Therefore, we're talking about authentication. Authorization is what level, what can he do once he access that system? So the answer is C as in Charlie. What should you do now? Go to Farhat Lectures, look at additional MCQs. That's going to do what? Help you understand these concepts better. The CPA exam is worth it. The, your, your accounting certification is worth it. Study hard, good luck, and stay safe.